you die, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. What? What on earth is he thinking of here? You die? Picks up on 2.20, since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, <coughs> why as though you still belong to the world, you submit to its rules? It's a metaphorical death. It's that death that we died when we, we stopped living that life and we started living this life. When we came to Christ, it describes finishing our hearts affair with this worldly stuff and breaking it off with the temple to live for, to inherit the eternal. And the idea is that when a person dies, they, they are no longer to do in this world. Their relationship to this world has ceased. They, they don't have an economic relationship to it. They don't have a social relationship to it. It's gone. There's been a radical separation. A thoroughgoing breaking off. Nothing to do with it anymore. You don't look to get anything from this world's things, nor do you invest in this place, says Paul. Your citizenship doesn't get to be in heaven when you expire, when you die. Your citizenship is in heaven now. Because you died to this world, and you trusted in Christ, and you're living for glory, not for the stuff that's passing away. Set your mind on the stuff that's above, says the Apostle. Seek it, get your mind on it, because you've already died to this stuff, and your citizenship is already in heaven. Here it is. Your life is a hidden life. You can't see it, smell it, touch it, taste it, kick it, you know? It's a hidden life. Your life is in heaven with God. And your five senses speak to you moment by moment throughout every day of things that are visible and tangible. And your sensory inputs are taken moment by moment from things that are material and visible. But the life you live, says Paul, the life lived in union with Jesus Christ, is a life that is hid, li lived out hidden from sight. Hidden from those senses. It's hidden from sight because the Christian's life is a life that is stored away in heaven with God and in fellowship with Him in the Spirit day by day. Feed it. Your life is not here in the temporary. It's up there in eternity, hidden with Jesus in God. Hidden here, but certainly not hidden up there. So don't go with the temporary visible stuff then. This stuff that's passing away, that the world that is also passing away, shoves up in your face. Your life is hidden with Christ. You died at some point in the past to this worldly life in sin. In a place that's passing under the night. So seek out the things that are found above and set your mind and run your aspirations on what's there. Where you're going if you want to, to get yourself God-pleasingly to that place. Here's the reason from your past. Here comes the reason from your future. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. That's where we're going. It'll be apparent then. It'll appear then. Fill your mind with this. going to achieve. That's what's going to achieve putting to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Living for heaven. Living with your mind run on that, not with the stuff that your eyes and your hands, your nose, your ears, been flooding into your head. We'll look more closely at this stuff next time. But for the moment, please be clear. Where this seeking the things above and this setting your mind on what's above, because of your past experience of Christ, because of your future hope of glory, let's set our minds on where this is going to take us. Be clear about this. See, Paul in these verses is, is deceit-proofing the people of God. And he's beginning to turn to sort of dealing with the moral implications of all of that. If you believe lies then uh, you end up living a life that's based on lies, and it's a life that isn't going to be terribly moral. It's going to be a life that says, this satisfies you, that satisfies you, this is what you want, this is the thing to go for, this will be great. It's not. So Paul in these verses has brought out his can of systemic weed killer, as it were, and he's going to wither off and eradicate from the roots those things that make you think you really should be doing better, and misdirecting you and the Colossians into that blindest of alleys, that blind alley of thinking that greater effort at rules and ritual and religion is the key to, to making you up as that far better person you want to be. You should be. It's not. It's of little value in restraining sensual indulgence, says Paul. What is? Seeking and setting your mind 
Not mind games, not myth building, not self-help and lying strategies. But filling your mind with the invisible realities of heaven, of Christ and of your salvation. Pursuing filling your mind with that hard, by faith, from day to day. It's a displacement approach. Set your mind on things above that Christ is seated at the right hand of God. See, it seems like a paradox this. It seems like a paradox, but it is not. That trying to be good the way human beings naturally try to be good, it simply doesn't cut it. And there are things to turn away from, but there are things to turn to. And if you're trying to turn away from it, you're not turning to it. You're not filling up your mind with this stuff, says Paul, forget it. You're going to fail. You're going to end up with the ritual, the religion, the rule scenario that Paul's been showing us in the preceding verses is the denial of the efficacy of Christ's cross. Saying it isn't sufficient. And also showing that your life isn't changed by it. Who's not troubled by sin? If you're a Christian, you're troubled by your sin. Because that sin put Jesus on the cross and it shows you up for being the failure that you are. But the way we fight back is by taking control of our thinking, says Paul. The things we seek and the things that we direct our gaze at. In short, what we do is we tackle indwelling sin in believers like this, by focusing our minds on things above, not on earthly things. If you're not thinking about it, you're going to do it. A young person once challenged, a Christian person, challenged by a fairly religious group of people that they were accountable to, about the conduct of their new relationship. Turned to the older Christian who was being quite legalistic about a lot of different things. Said, Listen, we don't look at anything, we don't touch anything, we certainly don't make out. Well, of course you don't, because you're not looking at anything, you're not touching anything. You're not filling your mind with things that are going to get you in trouble. Does that make sense? Paul says, don't fill your mind with things that are going to get you in trouble. Fill your mind with the things above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. There's no room for the other trash then, is there? Make sense? Makes sense. It's doing this, the thing, isn't it? And we do this rather than engaging in some sort of ritual, religion, rules-motivated, arm-wrestling contest with the enemy of souls. Think you're going to win that one? Forget it! We just shut him out. You don't have him in the bar to have the arm-wrestle in the first place. Easy! And we do it by filling our minds in. So that he is excluded by the presence of the God who alone has the strength to overcome him. Lord Jesus. We've died to earthly things. We've been raised with Christ. And the call of this passage is to so fill our thinking with this all-conquering, soul-satisfying Jesus, there is no room for the things that drag us down. And I'd say not only that this is the way to deal with sin that is biblical and effective, but that if you want a challenge, that's probably quite enough of a challenge in itself, isn't it? And that, it seems to me, is the lesson of Colossians 3.